there are a number of important lessons on prayer that we receive from the Apostle Paul. And I had never made that particular study, but in looking at his life and what he talked about prayer, I see a very deep, insightful apostle speaking in practical terms. Uh, and I, I appreciated the counsel about tell the brethren the lesson you're going to give them, and then at the end, remind them of the lesson you gave. That's a standard public speaking material that is really good because sometimes you lose the point. Well, here's three points on prayer that we learned from Paul. The first one is an important, they're all important, but this one is interesting. It's the attitude we should have when the Lord gives us an answer different than what we're seeking. That's hard to do. The second one is how Paul and Silas express gratitude in an experience that most normal people would never think of saying, thank you for this. <laughs> and the third one is the prayer life for your brethren. We look at the heartfelt prayer of the Apostle Paul for the Philippian brethren. Now, in looking at Paul's example of praying with the proper attitude, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, there are differences of opinion on what Paul was praying for here, but I'm going to take the traditional view that Paul was praying to have his eyesight restored. But whatever you feel he was praying for, because he doesn't really say, but whatever you think, the principles remain the same that we learned from Paul. Now, if he was praying about his eyesight, then he undoubtedly felt that the gospel would be better served if he could see better, that if he could write and not have someone to help him with that. And I think we can understand that. I'm sure I would be hard-pressed to give a discourse or write an article or be active if I couldn't see what I was doing. And so he saw a very natural reason why he needed to have that capacity back. And he felt strongly enough about his handicap that he had petitioned God on three separate occasions to have it healed. But as we know, God saw things differently. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. And he, that is God, said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. In other words, God said to Paul, Your weakness will not be taken away as you're requesting, but through it you will learn to lean on me and to look to me for guidance, and your ministry will not be hurt by that. Paul's amazing response he said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities in reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Oh, my goodness. What a response. Wouldn't you love to have that response in your heart every time the Lord says, no, no, not what you're praying for. This is a better way. He says he could glory and take pleasure of Christ would rest upon him. And of course, the natural question is, how can that be true? How can someone gain strength from someone else when they themselves are made that possible is because he saw his experiences that he was doing for Christ's sake knowing that he was suffering because he represents joy for him. It connected his suffering experiences with the noble work of Christ. I love that. When Paul's poor eyesight made his ministry more difficult, but then he saw these amazing results of hearts of people listening to his message and were thrilled by that. He could say to himself, this isn't because I'm so eloquent. It's the power of the message. It's the power of Christ that's doing this. I'm just privileged to be his mouthpiece for something far greater. He immediately looked for the answer of the benefit of doing it God's way. You know, in that there's an implied trust, isn't there, in that response. He believed that God's judgment was superior to his. And so when God answered Paul said, in principle, of course, now I see that my weakness will not interfere with my ministry. And through my weakness, I will have to rely on the Lord's strength. Now, early in verse 7, he had said, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, lest I should be exalted above measure. 
my goodness, again, there is tremendous faith and honesty, knowing that, okay, now I see that's what I need. All the things the Lord has given me to represent him, there's a chance that that would have gone to my head and my flesh would be elevated. But now I understand that God said, don't do that. And here's going to be your reminder towards that. And so we see a strong connection between faith and Paul's integrity of character to be so honest with himself when accepting God's answer in a prayer that was different than he requested. Brethren, if and when that happens to any of us, it is imperative that we do what Paul did and look for the wisdom in God's answer. In fact, that may be another reason to pray. If he gives us an answer different, then we're not quite getting it. Why did the Lord answer this way? That's a reason for prayer. And I think the Lord is thrilled when we go back to him and say, but Lord, why? Why did you answer this way? Because it causes our mind to think on a different level than the humanity we live with. The point here is that afflictions and trials can teach us essential lessons that prosperity often misses. Paul was so convinced of this principle that he could take pleasure in things that most people would never think of taking pleasure in. Second item, we see another powerful lesson on prayer during one of Paul's missionary journeys. In Acts 16, I'm sure you all know this story. It's a tremendous lesson. Paul and Silas were in Philippi. And as they were, as they were on their way to the synagogue to pray, they were confronted by a woman possessed of a spirit. And when she came to Paul, Paul cast out the demon from her. And the men who profited from her fortune-telling ability, they were enraged. And so they complained to the authorities. And as a result, Paul and Silas were beaten with many stripes. It says they were cast into the inner prison and their feet were put in stocks. This is what Acts 16, verses 25 and 26 say. It says, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. Everyone, not just Paul and Silas's. <laughs> now, I doubt that's what Paul was praying for. When the prison guards saw what happened, of course, it says he was gonna kill himself because he was afraid that the prisoners would all escape and he would be blamed for that. But as you know, that didn't happen. Paul calls out to him. He says, the prisoners are all here, even though their stocks are gone. And he then witnessed to the guard and to his whole family, and they were converted and baptized. What a turnaround of experiences, not just for Paul and Silas and the guards, but for this prison guard. But let's go back to the prayer while they were in prison. We're not told what they prayed about, but we're told that it was connection in connection with singing praises. So I'm going to speculate about what they might have been praying for. I think that in their prayer, they offered thanks for the privilege of suffering for Christ and with him. Now, look at the similarities of their experiences with that of the Lord's. They were beaten, just as Jesus had been, and they were thrown into a dark prison, just like Jesus. In both cases, undeserved suffering resulted from speaking the truth and doing good works. So Paul and Silas could literally identify their experience with the Lord. You know, brethren, when we can identify our physical or even our emotional suffering because we're serving the Lord, when our feet are tired because we've been serving all day at a fair, or we're doing some other service, stand the privilege of using our bodies to serve him, our response will naturally be more like Paul and Silas's we will find ourselves saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the privilege of using this body in some way to honor you. And what's neat about this experience is that the other prisoners heard them singing. And you know, they had to be affected by what they heard. Who in their right mind would be singing while in that prison with their feet in stocks? Paul and Silas's mental perception made that prison cell not a place of suffering, but it became a place of worship for them. Much like Golgotha, where Jesus' suffering was in a great sense his place of worship. Much like Daniel, who was thrown in the den of lions, 
he could sleep calmly while the king in his palace tossed and turned. Every trying experience we have can do that for us and make our place of suffering a meaningful place of worship. The third example that Paul left us. When we look at Paul, besides the doctrinal teaching, we see a man who cared deeply for the brethren. And he prayed for them. And he wanted them to be spiritually strong and faithful, especially to the Philippian brethren. This is what he wrote to them in chapter 1. This is verses 1 through 11. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you, all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. In this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of him. Well, these are the words of a man who loved those people with all his heart, and he only wanted to see them prosper spiritually. And they tell us why he was so passionate for the Philippian brethren. He saw in them partners in the gospel. Like Paul, they wanted to share the gospel message, and that commonality created a bond between them. It's a bond we should have with one another. Imagine feeling about all your brethren, what Paul is expressing here for the Philippian brethren. When Paul says they were partakers with him in his imprisonments, it tells us that they provided great moral support for them. And in fact, in one sense, they were with him right in that prison cell. I think he felt that strength from them. It says something interesting, that he prayed that their love would abound in knowledge and judgment. I found that a very interesting statement. I had to think about that for a while. How does love abound in knowledge? Well, let me ask an easier question. What do we know that should help our love to grow? I think we can make a long list of things that we know that help develop our hearts, but here's one, a key one. Our knowledge of what God has planned for us and for the world, a kingdom of righteousness, a life of joy that extends to all eternity shows us a fundamental part of the character of God and of his son. Without love, his plan probably would never have been devised and carried out. That foundation principle of love really establishes a model for us to strive for. Paul also prayed that the brethren's love would abound in judgment. The word judgment means discernment or perception. In other words, Paul is saying that our love will grow if we can perceive the value of one another. You know, in all honesty, sometimes we look at the brethren and we see them as fallen human beings because that's what's natural to our eyes. But Paul is saying, be discerning about that. Understand that you're dealing with saints who are striving to be faithful to God unto death in an environment that's contrary to that. Yes, we each struggle against our fallen tendency, but we each want to be faithful, making efforts to that end. That's why we're here today, isn't it? Because of our love for God and their desire to be faithful to him. That's the spiritual eyesight the Lord wants us to use when looking at the brethren. Appreciate what they are striving to become and discern their pure heart intents. Brethren, may your love abound in the knowledge of God and discernment of how valuable your brethren truly are. In his closing statement to the Philippian brethren, Paul writes this. He says, in nothing be anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall guard your hearts 
and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. And I think for many of us, life naturally creates anxiety, doesn't it? We often worry about things when we're not sure of the outcome or we think the outcome might be something we don't like. Paul's advice here is to take those matters to the Lord in prayer. The word supplication means petition. In other words, don't be afraid to ask God for a certain outcome. You know, when I first thought about that, I thought, well, who am I to ask God for any outcome? Is it proper to do that? Well, remember that, that's what Paul did. But he showed us how to add an important condition to our request, and I'm sure you all know what that is. Lord, I am asking this thing or this outcome, but only if it's pleasing to you. That's the only proper way to make a specific request before God. Paul also says, make your request known to God with thanksgiving. It's important to remember the Lord's providences of the past. Recall the many blessings he's given you. Showered you and know that his desire is for your spiritual welfare. If we have that attitude, our requests will never be demands, but calls for guidance and help. Paul says that when we approach the Lord with the right heart attitude, the result will be a peace that passes human understanding. Boy, I want more of that kind of peace, don't you? That's the antidote for human anxiety. For some of us, anxiety is always more of a struggle. But the solution is to speak often to the Lord about whatever is troubling us and ask for his help in controlling our thoughts and our emotions. One of the primary purposes of prayer, he says, is thanksgiving and daily recognition of the Lord's hand in our lives. Now, in Colossians chapter 2, Paul writes this. He says, As therefore ye received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and builded up in him, established in your faith, even as ye were taught, abounding with thanksgiving. Now, he doesn't mention prayer here, but he does highlight the importance of this idea of abounding in thanksgiving, not just saying thank you once in a while. Paul previously connected that with prayer. It was a common theme with him that make Thanksgiving a vital part of your prayer life. We need a certain perception, there's that word again, to understand that despite trials we may be facing, we have abundant reasons to be thankful for. Paul was thankful for his poor eyesight. He rejoiced in being severely beaten and thrown into prison, all because he perceived that the Lord was in those things. Brother, I think it would be a great exercise for us to either mentally or literally list our reasons for being thankful and then express those reasons to the Lord. I find that as I get older, my requests become less and less, and my expressions of thanksgiving have increased. And I think that's how it should be. And I'm learning to see the hand of providence in my life. And I'm sure you can relate to this. Brethren, there are simply not enough words that could properly express my heart appreciation for all the Lord has done for me, for my family, and for the privileges he's given me to serve him. I can relate to that idea of Paul in prison saying, thank you for that. But even though we might not have the right words, the words still are important. They still matter. And thanks to God and his precious son should be expressed regularly. In Romans 12, 12, Paul says, be instant in prayer. Now, prayer doesn't have to be a formal address every night when we kneel down, although that's very appropriate and good. But being instant in prayer means that we talk to God throughout the day. If something comes up and we need guidance, we can stop and ask, Lord, what should I do here? We want to communicate regularly on decisions needing to be made or we need to address something. It's, it's being constantly looking for the Lord's will in our life. So brethren, those are my three points. May the Lord help each of us see the tremendous value of prayer, especially in these three areas. Seeking God's will, as Paul did regarding his eyesight, but then being willing to accept a different answer if his wisdom dictates differently. And then offering thanksgiving and praise, even in our trials, as Paul and Silas did, because it causes us to look at things differently than our natural lives would do. 
And of course, praying for the spiritual welfare of our brethren, really caring about the brethren, wanting them to succeed, wanting them to know God better, and doing whatever we can to that end. May the Lord help us all to those three points.